According to China's official records, newly added cases in the country are in sharp decline. WHO endorsed the CCP numbers. These people know and they care about keeping these people alive, and and they do it successfully. People trapped in Wuhan's high rises, however, didn't seem to be on board as they shouted "fake, fake" when the vice premier of China paid a visit to the community. Three months into the coronavirus epidemic, patient zero is nowhere to be found. While skepticism towards the safety of China's labs continues to mount, some of the animal lab may be simply handling、uh, knockout mice, transgenic mice, or even mice、uh, inoculated with low pathogenic viruses.、Uh, so people may have the potentials、uh, to sell them for profit. Since the coronavirus outbreak began, questions, speculations, and doubts have surrounded the Chinese Communist Party's or CCP's handling of the situation. Now the virus has spread to much of the planet, but what happened and is happening in China is still of paramount importance because unless we know the truth of the epidemic, the origin and real identity of this virus, we won't be able to deal with it properly, and we won't be able to prevent it from coming back. So in this episode of Zooming In, we ask the following questions: Can we trust the World Health Organization's findings in China? Who is the real patient zero, and how safe are the laboratories in Wuhan? I'm Simon Gao, and you are watching Zooming In. On February 26th, the World Health Organization brought good news to the world. Dr. Bruce Elward, the team lead of the WHO China Joint Mission on COVID-19, held a press conference in Brussels to report their findings in China. He had this to say about their overall evaluation. You know, if I had COVID-19, I want to be treated in, in China. China know how to keep people alive、uh, from COVID. They're super committed to it, and they're making a massive investment in it as well. That's not going to be the case everywhere in the world, and as you've seen, we've had tragically lost people in you know G7 countries are are are, are dying of this disease, and、uh, so it is a serious、uh, disease. And I and I worry sometimes if we look at the China numbers, people are going to get a false sense of security. But these people know and they care about keeping these people alive, and and they do it successfully. They're really good at it. The WHO China Joint Mission includes 25 experts from eight countries. It was the first and the only foreign expert team allowed in China to investigate the epidemic. U.S. requests to send its own experts to China were repeatedly turned down. Why did China only allow WHO experts? Dr. Elwood was also open and direct about what propelled this WHO effort. I think, as most of you、uh, know, the genesis of the mission it was a request or a decision, actually, by、um, the president of China in a meeting with Dr. Tedros,、um, with a, a joint、uh, feeling that、uh, China had done a huge amount of work,、um, and it would could. Inform, let's say, both the global response as well as China's own response to have an independent mission come in and have a,、uh, a, a review and an assessment of what had been done and lessons for the way forward. So, if we paraphrase what Dr. Elwood said in Chinese context, it means this: Xi Jinping openly asked the WHO to endorse his leadership in combating the COVID-19 epidemic. Communist regimes have a consistent pattern of organizing foreign visit, with the USSR setting the precedent. Historically, this kind of joint mission would operate like this: the Chinese government arranged the itinerary, the government personnel would accompany the experts for the entire mission, the government also dictated what the foreign specialists saw, where they went, and who they talked to, from top to bottom. Dr. Elwood also offered evidence that the team only went to the safest places. I never had any exposures. You know, we were we are careful and we run careful.、Um, you know, we have no、uh, contact with patients. We have no contact with con- direct, you know, close contacts. We have no contacts with contacts. All the restaurants were closed, so we weren't even interacting with our group. Any of the hospitals we went to, we go into the clean section,、um, and we go nowhere near. You know, there's a dirty section, and then there's also a gray zone.、We、go nowhere near those things. The WHO team spent nine days total in China. They arrived on Saturday, February 16th, 
and convened for the first time on Sunday night. Dr. Elwood said the team spent the last three days writing a report with its Chinese partners. They went to four provinces, including Beijing, Wuhan, Guangdong, and Sichuan. These provinces and cities span across much of China, which means it would take at least two days for the travel time alone. So the team really had at most three days to work on the mission. And one of the most important conclusions Dr. Elwood and others drew was that the whole world owes Wuhan. Dr. Elwood presented a chart of the epidemic development in China over time. The inverted V-shaped curve, according to Elwood, is evidence of the Chinese government's achievement. When asked whether we could trust China's official numbers, Dr. Elwood said three of their own findings support the Chinese narrative. And one thing you can do is you can talk to doctors who are seeing patients who are running these massive uh, uh, hospitals. And, you know, everywhere you are hearing the same thing um, that, you know, we have open beds. And in Wuhan, it was like, we have open beds. We can get people out of, you know, isolation centers and into a proper hospital bed. And when we went and talked to the people at the fever clinic, you know, they were sitting there not scanning people or not testing people. And they said, you know, this is a change. We had lines and, and, and they aren't there anymore. And that's the second indicator that that is real. So while I was talking to him, I said, so how is enrollment going? And he said, it's a challenge. It's slowing down. It is slowed down because there are not enough new patients that we can actually recruit into the trial. Again, if everything the team saw in China was arranged by the government, we're not entirely sure if the first-hand evidence the team collected is really first-hand. In fact, social media and China's own media reports seem to contradict what the WHO team identified. We obtained this video from a Twitter feed. The tweet said, Vice Premier of China Sun Chunlan was visiting a community in Wuhan. Residents were not allowed to leave their apartments. They shouted, fake, fake, all fake, instead. And it's not just social media. China's official media's positive coverage of the coronavirus sometimes defeats its own purpose as well. According to a Xinhua News Agency report, on February 21st, the deputy mayor of Wuhan, Hu Yaobo, said that 19 more temporary hospitals will be built in the city. There are 13 such temporary hospitals in Wuhan right now, with over 13,000 beds. Over 9,000 of them are occupied, according to Hu. If the development of the epidemic is showing an inverted V-shape and the number of illnesses is on the decline, why should Wuhan continue to build so many temporary hospitals? Wu Yaobo said that on February 25th, there would be 30,000 beds which is over double the current amount. If the existing beds are not fully occupied, why are so many more beds needed? Meanwhile, internal CCP documents received by the Epic Times show that government departments and agencies are required to destroy documents and data related to the outbreak. The document was circulated in Liaoning province, which is 1,000 miles away from the virus Epic Center in Hubei. Confidential internal documents from Shandong province also show that authorities are purposefully underreporting the number of testing kits that returned positive results. The actual number of new cases at the time was up to 52 times more than officially reported. On top of that, change of testing methodology adds to the confusion of Chinese data. On February 26, Five senior officials in Hubei province reported negative 107 new cases. Later that day, 10 other cities also reported negative cases. The strange numbers came from shifting methodology inside China for giving confirmed diagnosis. Originally, only results from nucleic acid testing were considered valid. Then briefly, China shifted to accepting CT scan results, only to change back to the nucleic acid testing shortly after. So when 112 patients tested positive on CT scans, only five of them tested positive with a nucleic acid test. The result was negative 107. Despite all the doubts we have regarding official numbers coming out of China, 
we're not making a definitive conclusion that the epidemic in China is not coming down. We simply don't know for sure. Yes, WHO's A-plus grade on the Chinese government's handling of the epidemic is a textbook definition of propaganda. Nevertheless, we're not sure either whether such propaganda doesn't work at all. Here's an interview clip of Vice President Pence on Fox News. There was some encouraging news uh, that uh, there were actually fewer new cases in China than in the balance of the rest of the world. And we uh, believe them? Well, we, we had CDC officials that were just in China a few short weeks ago, and they informed me that they were able to look at the raw data. And from their initial look, um, it, it did line up with much of the data that we were receiving. Who are these CDC experts Vice President Pence mentioned, and what raw data could they have? I asked Dr. Shang Ling these questions. He is a Chinese and American trained microbiologist, former lab director of the viral disease branch of the Water Raid Army Institute of Research, and was involved in the outbreak response for MERS in the Middle East in 2014. So yes, there are two medical doctors from the United States attended this mission. Uh, one of them is Dr. Clifford Lane, who is the clinical director for National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Disease. Uh, another doctor is uh, Dr. Wei Gongzhou uh, in the uh, influenza division from CDC. So the problem is that the medical experts in these joint missions from other countries, they have to uh, be accompanied by other Chinese uh, experts and Chinese security people in this joint mission. And throughout their whole uh, trip in China, they only have one day visit Wuhan, the epicenter of the outbreak. So what can you find out in one day, right? And also uh, from their reports, you can clearly see uh, they, they acknowledge the knowledge gap regarding about the animal origins, natural reservoir for the viruses, and also they clearly mentioned there is a uh, problem uh, to understand the animal-human uh, interface for the early outbreaks and also the early exposure of this virus uh, could not be identified. That means they couldn't identify the patient zero. So all these key questions actually point out a, a clear failure for early epidemiology study or disease control in Wuhan. So this is, I think, the key funding and, and it's a core question. Um, but uh, this mission couldn't find any more information about these key questions. And of course, the Chinese medical doctors, scientists have put a lot of efforts to treat the patients, study the virus, contain the outbreaks. And of course, they had made huge sacrifice for this. But for this kind of uh, joint mission, the key issue is you need to address the core problem. Um, if the core problem is not answered, then I think the raw data still uh, doesn't give you much more information. And this is very likely to be uh, just like a cover up under the banner of WHO, similar to the Chinese government's uh, inviting journalists to visit the labor camp and prisons after they move out the Falun Gong practitioners or Uyghurs from this location. And so what you find is just what the government wants you to see. What is your assessment of the epidemic in China now? So um, I'm not optimistic at all about the epidemic uh, situations in China. First, it would be a terrible mistake to trust the propaganda from Chinese state-run media telling the people uh, the outbreak has been contained and even blaming the United States as a potential origin of the viruses. And actually, uh, from the reports from Chinese medical doctors, we know even in January and February, 83% of the infection were due to cluster gatherings, you know, like family gatherings, uh, social events, or maybe working units. And now the Chinese government is pushing people back to work, uh, pushing the factory to resume production. But we know there are many reports about um, factory workers got infected and then the whole factory got quarantined dumps. And so this is a very dangerous situation. The Chinese government is incubating a second round of a big outbreak in China. Coming up, who is the real patient zero of the COVID-19 outbreak?
generally in the outbreak, finding patient zero or index case can greatly assist doctors and the scientific community in combating the disease. When the person is identified, then the way the person got sick can likely be identified as well. However, China has so far given both limited and questionable data on who patient zero actually is. Official statements from the Wuhan Health Authority said that the first case of the COVID-19 appeared in Wuhan on December 8, 2019. The man was later cured and released from the hospital. He had no contact with the Huanan seafood market, which the Chinese authorities claim is the source of the outbreak. However, two other reports contradict this statement. Reports from both The Lancet on January 24th and the BBC on February 18th state that the first case appeared one week earlier on December 1st. The patient was a bedridden man in his 70s. He had no contact with the seafood market either. Nevertheless, the Chinese health authorities insist that the virus came from the seafood market. On February 17th, BBC interviewed one of the Lancet article author, Dr. Wu Wenjuan, who was also the director of the intensive care unit at Jingying Tan Hospital that treated the bedridden man. Wu told the BBC that because he was ill, he basically did not go outdoors. The Lancet study said that none of the man's family members developed any fever or respiratory symptoms. When asked by the BBC about the man having no connection to the market and if there's another source of his infection, Dr. Wu responded that their research was now moving in that direction. Yet we have not heard from Dr. Wu Wenjuan about that research since. This should be pretty straightforward. A bedridden man who had no contact with the seafood market was infected with the virus. How could he have caught it? The first guess would be from people who were around him. If his family members didn't have symptoms, then what about people who visited the family? The list shouldn't be too long. Yet, two months into the epidemic, the true patient zero has not yet been identified. Furthermore, Chinese health officials have made no changes to the claim that the seafood market was the source of the virus, despite multiple research indicating a large percentage of the early patients having no contact with the market. Not only that, Chinese researchers claim that they have found the origin of the virus in absence of patient zero. On January 20th, one Chinese doctor named Shi Zheng Li, along with her team, submitted a paper study to Nature, naming bats as the source of the COVID-19. Dr. Shi also happens to be a researcher at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. Before the institute opened, her research already was focused on other coronaviruses, like SARS from the 2002 Chinese outbreak. What has Dr. Shi accomplished in her two decades of research and study, and what does her research mean? I asked Dr. Shang Lin this question. So Dr. Shi Zhengli's group has done a lot of research on coronavirus. Uh, for example, in 2010, her group identified Chinese horseshoe bed uh, having a receptor that can bind into the SARS coronavirus S protein, a mutation in the receptor binding domain can actually modulate the binding affinity. And then on 2013, her team published another major discovery. Uh, this time they actually identified uh, two virus strains in a horseshoe bed. And these two strain virus showing 95% identity in nucleotide with the SARS coronavirus. And these two viruses can also uh, bind into the receptor in bat, civets, and uh, human. So this is the strongest evidence about this potential transmission route you know, from bat, uh, civets to human. And her team continued to study what might be the potential uh, emergent, uh, maybe the potential epidemic strain for SARS. So on 2015, they published another article, and this time they created a chimeric virus and using the S protein from the back coronavirus and put it in the backbone of a mouse adapted to SARS coronavirus. And to their surprise, this virus actually showing gain of function because it's showing infectivities in the human airways, uh, epithelial cells, and it also uh, showing lung pathogenesis in animal models with mice. 
So this is actually related to the medical ethic issue about gain of function studies. Uh, Dr. Shi's group has all the capacities. They have their uh, coronavirus reverse genetic systems. They, they are good at introducing mutations on S proteins. And they have all the wild type bat coronavirus and uh, SARS coronavirus strains. So it really depends on whether they continue this kind of gain of function studies and they are fully aware of the risks of these gain of function studies. The new virus Dr. Shi and her team constructed in 2015 is not the same virus from this outbreak. However, the fact that Dr. Shi, as head of the Wuhan Institute of Virology, has studied various SARS coronaviruses and has constructed high pathogenic coronaviruses in the lab. Her lab is very close to the epicenter of this outbreak, and there are more microbiology labs in Wuhan, begs a number of questions. One of them, of course, is how safe are Chinese laboratories? Chinese laboratories have a history of lax standards and leaked pathogens. During the SARS outbreak, the virus was leaked from the lab twice. In both cases, Individuals who worked at the Chinese Institute of Virology in Beijing became infected. One of the individuals went on extensive railway trips before being hospitalized. Another instance of lack security came from selling lab animals to local markets. According to China's own media reports, the man named Li Ning was a biologist at the China Engineering Academy. He was found to have sold experimental pigs cows and milk to local markets between 2008 and 2012. Li and his colleagues kept the money from the sales, close to $1.5 million. He was sentenced to 12 years in prison on January 2, 2020. According to a 2016 report from the China Experimental Animal Information Network, Chinese researchers use tens of millions of laboratory animals every year. The Experimental Animal Research Center of Hubei Province alone handles about 300,000 animals a year, either for bioresearch experiments inside the center or to be sold and distributed to other labs in Hubei Province. How widespread is the practice of Chinese researchers selling lab animals? Could the virus have leaked from the labs because of this behavior? Here's Dr. Ling again. So regarding about the potential lab leak, uh, this is really related uh, to the lab management issues. Because some of the animal lab may be simply handling uh, narco mice, transgenic mice, or even mice uh, inoculated with low pathogenic viruses. Uh, so people may have the potentials uh, to sell them for profits, uh, but it is a management issue. Uh, meanwhile, I want to bring your attention to one article published by two scientists uh, in China. One of them is in uh, Guangzhou, one of them is actually in Wuhan, uh, in Huazhong University of Science and Technology. So in this paper, they identify a lab that was run by uh, Wuhan's CDC, Center for Disease Control and Prevention. So this animal lab actually contained hundreds of bats collected in the wild uh, in Hubei province, in Zhejiang province. And the collector actually was reported uh, to be attacked by bats for multiple times and he had to quarantine himself for a couple of times too. And of course the animal lab have to do surgeries on animals to study on their uh, tissues and organs. And so the tissue samples and contaminated trash are the source of the pathogens. So you know if these are not managed very well and they could have contaminated uh, the environment and people contacting these uh, traces as well. So this lab is actually only 280 meters away from Huanan Seafood Market and it is adjacent to a uh, Union Hospital where the first batch of uh, Chinese doctors got infected during the epidemic. So this is alarming. And of course, this is only a potential of lab leak and no solid proof being identified and revealed so far but it is a potential. On February 29th, 2020, at the Conservative Political Action Conference, CPAC, China expert Michael Pewsbury made this comment about the coronavirus. One of the things President Xi and President Trump have talked about three times this year by phone is the coronavirus 
and what China needs to tell us that we need to know about this virus. They posted the analysis of the virus online. This is not the way the secretive Chinese usually do business. Then it was pointed out to them, not publicly, but by people who are loyal to President Trump. This virus comes from one thing, either from a laboratory in Wuhan, which we're not accusing you of, or eating wild animals that you buy in a huge market in Wuhan. Yesterday, the Chinese passed a law. By the way, they usually say their laws take two or three years to pass. In two weeks, they passed a law banning all Chinese from eating wild animals. Pewsbury's account of China's reaction was not complete, though. On February 15th, 10 days prior to the legislation of banning consumption of wild animals, the Chinese Ministry of Science and Technology published a directive titled Instructions on Strengthening Biosecurity Management in Microbiology Labs that Handle Advanced Viruses like the Novel Coronavirus. What does this directive mean? Here's what Dr. Ling told me. So this new directive clearly suggesting there were major management of biosecurity hazards uh, related to these microbiology labs handling uh, highly pathogenic viral pathogens. So of course, when the directive was issued, it kind of implies the Chinese government accept the potential of lab uh, leak. No doubt. Chinese doctors and nurses are working extremely hard to combat the epidemic. So are the Chinese people. But unless the firewall comes down completely and the CCP allows foreign experts into China freely, the outside world won't know what's truly happening in China. And neither will the Chinese people. In WHO's press briefing, Dr. Ellsworth did not mention how the CCP's suppression of information in the first couple of months has taken away many lives and allowed the disease to spread around the world. But these facts simply won't go away. Thanks for watching Zooming In. I'm Simone Gao, and see you next time.